This is Mind Pump. Today's episode, we brought back Jim Quick to the podcast. Now, remember, he had a severe head injury as a child, was told he would never succeed, but figured out how to maximize his memory, his fluency, and his brain power, brought it to the masses. This guy is a brain coach. In fact, he works with some of the biggest celebrities ever, uh, A-Rod, Jim Carrey, Will Smith. This guy will blow your mind with how he can improve your mind. Also, he has this free quiz right now online. It's pretty cool. Uh, I found out I was a dolphin. I believe Justin was a dolphin. Can't remember what Adam was. I think he was a cheetah. Pretty interesting quiz. You can go to Quick Brain. Quick is spelled with a K. So quickbrain.com forward slash animal dash quiz. Find out what you are, and then it's pretty illuminating. It helps uh, direct you on how you should operate. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, by the way, his book is the Limitless Expanded Edition. So Limitless went crazy, gangbusters. Well, this is the Expanded Edition. Make sure you check out his book. Today's giveaway is the Super Bundle. That's a lot of programs. If you want to win that, here's what you got to do. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We also have a sale going on this month. The Beginner Strength Training Program, MAPS Resistance is half off, and then MAPS Prime Pro. This is great for correctional exercise. Great for trainers and coaches, by the way. It's also 50% off. So if you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Jim, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back, guys. Always one of yeah. our favorite guests. It's been a little while. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's been, been a, a minute. Was it been four years? No, we did it. We did it. We did yeah. it over the phone for when Limitless first oh, first dropped. Yeah. So yeah, that was yeah, like yeah. a how long ago was it? It's been three years. Yeah. Holy oh, shit! It's boom. been three. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been a long time. No, it's like was three, like three and a half years. Wow. Yeah. So I want to ask oh. you because before you came on, yeah. your team sent us uh, a, a quiz to take. Yeah. To tell us what kind of like brain type you have brain yeah. type and then it, it, it used an animal yeah. to represent our brain type so which ironically matches sal's lower back tattoo <laughs> <laughs> i'm happy about this results yeah this is Adam's this dolphin jumping over the rainbow so listen yeah. uh i was a dolphin justin was a dolphin doug was a dolphin adam was a cheetah what is all the like what is the quiz yeah. why do we take that what is so uh yeah so after 30 years of being a brain coach, I realized that everybody learns a little bit different and everyone's brain is a little bit, uh, has a different type in terms of how they think, how they lead, how they communicate, uh, how they buy, how they, how they invest, all these different things. And we found that they primarily found there are four buckets, four different animals types that your brain could, uh, could re like represent. And once you know your, your brain animal, then you know how to study better, focus better, improve your memory. And it's kind of like, um, like personalized medicine based mm. on your genetics or personalized nutrition based on your, let's say your microbiome. This is like personalized learning. So we created an assessment that I've been using with clients one-on-one uh, -on -one for a few years. Um, and now we've offered it out to the public. It's a four minute quiz, kind of like a, which Harry Potter or Game of Thrones character are you yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and yeah, it's, it's very telling because once people go through it, they get a detailed report on how they could learn and lead and, and live just, just with greater ease and, and effectiveness. So I, I, I could go through it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Animals, give us yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. People options. could take the uh, the quiz. It's at mybrainanimal.com. Uh, there's nothing to buy, but it's, uh, and then you get a detailed report. But so it's a brain code, C-O-D-E. And uh, we'll turn this into a little master class for uh, brain fitness. <laughs> the, uh, so the C is the cheetah. And these are your fast actors. And you probably could, you can think about everyone listening right now could think of like which one you identify with most. These are people who thrive in fast paced environments. They adapt very quickly. They have very strong intuition. Um, and they they are very direct. They may they make things happen. They, they, they implement. Uh, the O are your owls. And your owls, if you think about them, they're just very logical, right? These are people who love data. They love facts. They love figures, uh, formulas. Uh, these are people that, um, you know, would make decisions based on, on things like logic, right? Um, and even if you just, just based on those two, those two people would act differently, right? They would relate differently. They would, they would buy differently, invest differently. The D are your dolphins, which I'm surrounded by them here. here. <laughs> um, in here yeah. yeah, these are your creative visionaries. These are people who have very strong pattern recognition. 
Uh, these are individuals that have a vision for something, a project or a business. Maybe uh, others, uh, dolphins can relate to, or they can't see it quite quite as clearly. And then finally, the E are your elephants, and these are your uh, these are your collaborators. They're extremely loyal. They hold groups together. They um, have high levels of uh, deep empathy and interpersonal skills. And so once you understand your brain type, it allows you to kind of, you know, changes the way you could work and learn and kind of operate throughout the world because it informs certain behaviors. And even when I mentioned this, you could take any, I don't know, uh, let's take uh, like James Bond, right? You know, James Bond would be, would be a cheetah, right? A very fast actor, you know, you're very, very intuitive, uh, uh, you know, thrives in fast paced environments, they handle difficulty. Um, let's say you would have M, right? Who's head of uh, MI6. Mm. Yeah, she would be logical, you know, extremely logical, organized, uh, rational, um, makes decisions based on her, her left brain. Um, Someone like her right hand uh, would be, let's say, uh, let's say Q. Q is the creative visionary. He's the, he's the one that makes all the, inven is the inventions, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of people believe the future belongs to those creators, but you could take anything like Star Wars, um, which I, I, I love how this, the studio has evolved, <laughs> Thank you. but, but yeah, Luke Skywalker would be a cheetah, right? Um, you know, the, uh, Chewbacca would be, would be an elephant, you know, very loyal, uh, keeps people together, you know, uh, Obi-Wan, I think would be an owl, you know, uh, Leia would definitely be a creative visionary. It would be more like a dolphin. So you could kind of, kind of people could see themselves in this. Like, now, when I took the the quiz, I definitely did find, I don't know, maybe half of them, I could have went either or. Right, and I right, tried right. my best to like, mm -hmm. just make the first reaction. Yeah. Now- Which is exactly what a cheetah would do, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Typical <laughs> cheetah. Good point, good point. I, did, I didn't want to overthink it because I figured my gut instinct is probably what I'll be most like. Yeah. But uh, I mean, do you find in the years that you've been coaching people and helping people that you've also had to figure out like, oh, there a little bit of this and yeah. a little bit of that. And therefore certain strategies I would use on them versus With, others? Without a doubt. So nobody's any one, one animal, right? We're, we're composite of all of them. Just like if you use your right hand, doesn't mean you don't use your left hand. It's just when you're, you know, when you're using it, it just feels more natural. Sometimes when people learn, the way the person teaches is different than the way the learner prefers to learn. And it's like two ships in the night and you pass each other and you don't even recognize that the other one's there. Mm. You know, you had the kind of experience before and there's no connection, right? But we, have, we all have a primary and a secondary. You know, for, for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a strong elephant, maybe because I grew up with my learning difficulties and I developed this kind of empathy of people suffering around me because I knew what it felt like, you know, kind of being marginalized and, you know, with my learning disabilities and everything. But, um, and then, I, you know, I've, I've also grown to be a, a strong owl. Like I love data, I love research, I love reading white papers. Um, but yeah, and, you know, but when our team took it, we found that uh, it's, it's interesting how people find their element in their life, especially roles in, in work. Mm. Like our customer uh, support team, they're like nearly all elephants because they're, they're, they're there, they have high levels of empathy, uh, interpersonal skills, they're there to be able to serve and keep the community together. You know, uh, we, have a, we have an accountant who took it and he's, he's purely an owl and you want your financial person to be an owl, right? You don't want them to be creative or maybe you do, and I'm not really sure, but um, you know, and my, my, my business partner, um, our CEO, Alexis, she's a, she's a dolphin. She has a creative vision for our business that, you know, it's, she, it's very clear, right? Um, you know, to impact, I mean, make it better, brighter brains, you know, no brain left behind. We want to, we want to impact a billion brains. So I actually see where this could be a really cool like interview strategy, like to, if, I wish we had this tool before we hired a lot of people. Cause I think it makes sense that you would like every representation of every animal in, yeah. a, in a, a business like this, where you kind of need all those different personalities and what a, what a, what a cool idea to, how to did do that. you, how did you put this together? Cause you created this. Yeah. I, I drove, you know, I realized that people are asking the same question, but, and when I give people protocols and I don't know if it's the same in fitness, but you know, not everybody, um, embraces everything, right? Not everything's for everybody, just you know, whether it's, maybe it's diet or workout strategies. Same thing with reading, memory. Everyone wants like, <clears throat> this is the process, but I realized that it worked for a handful of people, uh, but not everybody. And so this was my way of personalized learning for, for people. So I, I drew on mm -hmm. psychologies and sciences like uh, personality types, like Myers-Briggs mm -hmm. was an inspiration. Uh, left brain, right brain, lateralization, dominance, like, you know, you know, we built that in introvert, extrovert, ambivert. 
uh, pulled from multiple intelligence theory, Harvard, uh, Howard Gardner's work out of Harvard uh, University. So we pulled from a lot of different disciplines and uh, just made it incredibly simple. You know, I think one of our superpowers is taking very complex information and make it very relatable and usable and effective, you know, for people who, who use it. Introvert, extrovert, ambivert? Is Ambivert's that kind of like a combo yeah. of, like for me, I'm, I'm very introverted, you know, um, and then I became painfully shy with my learning disability, not be able to read like all the kids. My mom became a special ed teacher in the public school system just to help me with my, my learning difficulties. Um, but yeah, I'm very introverted, but there's some people, yeah, I was interesting. I was having a conversation with Susan Kane, who wrote, um, quiet. Have you ever, this is like mm -hmm. the book for introverts and, uh, Simon Sinek, you know, start with yeah, why. Of course. And, and they were saying, you know, we're, we're having this meal and she was saying that introverts are people that wake up with five gold coins, like energy coins. And every single time they interact with somebody, they have, they give up one of their coins to that person until they're depleted and they have to get by themselves and recharge. But extroverts, they wake up with no gold energy coins and they're, they just, they want to interact with people so they could get energy, right? They could collect coins and it's kind of interesting. But ambivert it's kind of like a combination of, of the two, somebody who could express like an extrovert, but also they recharge like an introvert. That's me. That's yeah. Me. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, people, when they meet me or they see me on the show, they think I'm an extrovert. Yeah. Um, I'm extroverted in situ certain situations, but also introverted in other situations. So like if I'm doing this, very extroverted, especially when I'm talking about things I'm passionate about. Yeah. Otherwise I, I, you know, I'd, I'd rather not be around lots of people. Yeah. Me on stage is the same thing. You know, <clears> I'm <throat> in front of a good 250,000 people a year. Uh, it's just speaking. I can be on three continents, but I do it. It's just not my nature. You know, my two biggest challenges were learning and public speaking when I was a kid. Life, life has a sense of humor because that's all I do. <laughs> yeah, it's learning it. and it's about. wild to me because you wouldn't yeah. guess that if you only caught you on like your YouTube TED yeah, Talk yeah. stuff, like you wouldn't realize. Because I know if I were an introvert on stage, I'm not going to be very effective, right? You, know, you have to bring you know a certain level of of, of energy, a certain level of uh, interactivity kind of uh, to get people's attention. How did you uh, work through that? Because public speaking yeah. is always top three. Fear. Number one fear. Yeah, yeah, for a lot people of people. yeah. Depending on different things. I, I've heard it's, you know, I've heard a rating where it's number one is fear of public speaking. Number two is fire. Number three is death, you know, yeah. which is, you know, pretty, pretty crazy. You know, the old joke is that if you're at a funeral, you know, somebody would rather be in the box than, the, than giving the eulogy because mm -hmm. they're so fearful of public yeah. speaking. I think it came from those, you know where I think it came from? I think it came from those book reading circles. I don't know, when you first learned how to read, did yeah. you do you yeah, that exercise? The teacher made you do a- Yeah, a, a, and you had to they pass turn. around the book and yeah. then you had to read out loud like a yeah. paragraph or a page. And when I had my head injury when I was five years old, it took me three years to learn how to read. And that was very embarrassing, right? And so every single time that thing got closer, you know, when. I, I would be even talking about it messes me up right now. I could feel like my heart rate going up and like my mouth getting dry, just thinking about it, but I would get the book and I, the words didn't mean anything. And I just, you know, I was so embarrassed and had so much shame. I would just pass the book on. Mm -hmm. But I think that association got associated to public speaking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, cause who's really good at that, you know, in, in the beginning. No. Right. And so, so um, yeah. And so my superpower, I talk about superpowers a lot is because I learned how to read by reading comic books. Mm. You know, I'm, you know, an uncle gave me a comic book when I was a kid and, you know, I would have this one comic book, you know, my parents immigrated to the States, you know, we live in the back of a laundry mat, didn't have a lot of like resources, but at night I would be like underneath the covers reading this comic book and something about the illustrations like brought the story to life. Mm. Um, but that's why I talk about superpowers. My superpower growing up as a kid really was being invisible. You know, it was because I never had the answer. So I didn't want to get called on. So think about how that informed my behavior. I would sit behind the tall kid. I would sit all the way in the back. I would shrink down all the time. And uh, when I was nine years old, I was slowing down to class pretty more than usual. And I was being teased more <clears> than <throat> usual. And a teacher came to my defense, pointed from, to me in front of the whole class and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. And that, that label became my, my limit. You know, I remember I was failing freshman high, high school English and I, they pulled, they called, it was so embarrassing because like they brought my parents in from work and they had that parent teacher meeting and, uh, she, you know, she laid it out for us and saying I was going to fail this class and gave me an opportunity to do a book report to, you know, pass. 
and it was on Albert Einstein. She chose, you know, this genius. And I, I spent weeks and weeks at the library before there was internet, right? And, uh, and the day I was due, I actually felt proud for the first time, you know, being what, what am I, 14 years old mm -hmm. or whatever. And uh, my parents had it professionally bound and surprised me with it. So I couldn't wait to hand it in. The day it was due, I'm sitting in class, towards the end of class, I can't wait to hand it in. I'm so excited uh, to show her my work. And the teacher said, hey class, we have a surprise. Jim, come to the front of class and give your book report. And I freaked the heck out. You had no idea you were gonna read it I had no idea. She never said I had to like present oh, it. So I am like dying inside and I can't even catch my breath. And I, I like stutter out, I didn't do it. I just, I just looked her in the, in the eyes and I lied to her because I just, that was so terrified. And you could see the disappointment in her face. But after the class let out and I was the only one in the class, because I couldn't even get up, hmm. I, I got up and then went, went into my book bag, took out the, this professionally bound book report I spent weeks on. And uh, on the way out, I, by the door, there was a trash can. I just threw it out. Oh shit, you, you didn't know? give it to her? No, because I just, you know, that's how bad I was. You know, so how I got over it though was, um, you know, after I learned these skills when I was 18 years old to read two or three times faster, improve their memory, all that stuff that I teach, um, I, I just felt a moral obligation, you know, to help other people because it's kind of like shame on shame on you if you know something that could help somebody who's suffering and then, you know, offer that, uh, you know, available. And so I started to teach and one of my very first students she read 30 books in 30 days. Like how crazy is that? Mm -hmm. Not scan, skim, but read him. And I wanted to find out not how, I know how I taught her, but I want to know why. I'm always curious, like why people do what they're supposed to do, what they know they should do and why some people don't. Most people don't, mm -hmm. right? It's common sense, it's not common practice. And I found out that her motivation, her mom, and I get choked up thinking about it. Her mom was dying of terminal cancer, was given two months to live. And the books she was reading were books to save her mom's life, mm. you know? And that's a big drive, right? And so I wished her luck, prayers. Six months goes by, I don't hear from her. I get a call one morning and she, it, she's crying hysterically, like just for, I don't know how long, but when she stops, I find out their tears of joy that her mother not only survived, but is really getting better. Doctors don't know how, they don't know why, they called it a miracle, but her mother attributed 100% to great advice she got from her daughter who learned it from all these books, you know? And in that moment, I was only 18 years old. In that moment, I realized that if that if knowledge is power, then learning is our superpower. And it's a superpower we, we all have, you know? And that really gives me the confidence, you know, the moral conviction to go on stage and do things that are difficult, even being on video, because it's very, the opposite of like, what's comfortable for Jim, me. Jim, when you look at uh, the way that we teach children conventionally yeah. in schools, mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of things wrong in the way that we do it? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've had conversations with people at a high mm -hmm. level in government here. They use our, our systems and, you know, in school systems and some of the top school systems like Finland and in, um, in South Korea, you know, things are slow to change. And I don't think it's teachers so much as the system. Like my mother, again, is a school teacher. She recently, you know, she, she dedicated her whole life to public school system and recently retired. But the, the, the world has changed so much, but the this, this classrooms haven't. They say if Rip Van Winkle, you know that guy who slept for like decades? Yeah. If he woke up today, the only thing he would recognize are our schools. <laughs> you know, we live in an age of autonomous electric cars just going out right around here, right? Um, spaceships that are going to Mars, but our vehicle of choice when it comes to learning and education is more like, like a horse and carriage, you know? And so I, I do see some issues. I mean, they don't even teach, you know, a lot of, you know, like what, what a lot of your guests speak on, you know, with, you know, whether, whether it's health and wellness, uh, you know, fitness. I can, I can speak personally to this, Jim, because uh, I mean, I, I got diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. So neurodivergent. Yeah. Uh, love learning. I love learning. I consume information um, like crazy. It's one of my favorite things to do. I know it's one of the things I bring to the show, but I hated school. This is the place where I'm supposed to learn, uh, where I'm supposed to get information and it was uh, painfully unstimulating and boring, which is sad when I look back because I was a kid that loved learning. You would think yeah. that in a place like that, it would thrive, but it was the way they delivered it. It was how it was put together that not only made it challenging for me, 
it made it so that I couldn't wait to get out of there. I, was just I can't wait to get out of here so I could go learn on my own. Yeah. It's actually what I used to do. I'd go and read things I wanted to read and learn things I want to learn. Um, so I know this, yeah. I know this firsthand and, and I wonder how many, uh, thankfully I, I grew up uh, with good parents and I, you know, developed a good work ethic and I was able to become an entrepreneur and, and develop my own success outside of that system. But um, how many kids do you think were, yeah. were screwing up or, or just, they just believe that they're not smart. You know? Yeah. I mean, that was definitely me. Every single time, you know, I was labeled broken. Every single time I did badly in school, I would always say, which was all the time, I would say, oh, because I have the broken brain. You know, every time I was in pick for sports, which was often, it was, I always say, oh, because I have the broken brain. So, uh, you know, and adults have to, they have to be very careful of their external words because they often become a child's internal words, <clears throat> you know. But going back to the school system, yeah, school teaches you a lot about what to learn, like math and history and science, Spanish. But there are zero classes on how to learn those subjects. There's no class called focus, right? Or like going to a kid and saying focus or study. That's like going to somebody say play the ukulele, who's never taken any kind of training or class right. on how to do that. It's just kind of expected. So I feel like uh, you know schools, you know, they teach you what to learn but not how to learn. And I think the how is more important than the mm -hmm. what because the world's always changing, the half-life of information, new research, you know, keeping current with everything. Um, you know, there's no class called memory even, right? They teach you three R's in school, in traditional education. Uh, what is it? Reading, writing, arithmetic. Mm -hmm. Obviously spelling is now, it's not one of them. <laughs> yeah. But what about retention, right? Socrates said, learning is remembering. Mm -hmm. And going back to your example, Sal, like it's, there's this Mark Twain quote that said, don't let school get in the way of your, your education. You know, that. so like you left school and then you started doing your mm -hmm. own, you know, your own personal education. I think now it's more important than ever that people are always learning, listening to podcasts like yours and ours and, you know, reading books, you know, getting their education to kind of complement what they're not getting in, in traditional education. Now, didn't you develop a curriculum around this in terms of how to learn, how to yeah. retain information, how to read, uh, you know, a little more effectively? Uh, and it, when did you start that? And how did you put all that together? So when I was 18, okay, so I, don't, I haven't shared this. I don't share this very often. But when I was 18, I was lucky enough to get into a local uh, uh, college, you know, uh, and I chose one that I knew other people from my school wasn't going to. So because part of what keeps you stuck is like the expectations of others. And if they see you in a certain way, you kind of feel like you have to stay in that kind of box. You start to right? see yourself that way. Yeah, very much so. And I knew I, knew, I, I was self-aware enough to know that I didn't want that influence, right? I want to start fresh. I thought being a freshman meant I could make a fresh start. And I took all these classes and I did worse, like like really worse because university is a lot harder than, than, than high school, right? So much is on your own. And uh, so I, I was ready to quit because I, I didn't have the money to be in school. My family didn't have that. And, I, and I'm the oldest of, of three kids and I want to be a good example. And I'd rather them use the money, for, honestly, for my, my younger siblings because I felt like I was just too dumb. And so I said this to my friend and he was like, well, you know, tell your parents you're going to quit. That's a big life decision. Why don't you come home with me this weekend? I'm going to visit my folks, get some perspective. So I do. And the family is pretty well off, nice home on the, on the water. And he, the father's walking me around the property before dinner and asked me a very simple question. He's like, Jim, worst question, how's school? <laughs> and I just start bawling in front of this complete stranger because I have all this pent up angst, right? And shame and tell him my whole story, broken brain, quit school. He was like, well, why are you in school? What do you want to be? What do you want to do? What do you want to have? Share. And I honestly, no one's ever asked me that question before. I thought, you know, like I'm in school because that, that's what you're supposed to do, right? I didn't know. And when I start to come up with some answers about what my goals would be, he stops me and takes out a piece of paper out of his back pocket and makes me write them down. Like, a, I don't know if you guys write your goals down or like mm -hmm. a bucket list, right? And it's my first time doing that exercise. When I'm done, I start folding it up to put it in my pocket and he rips it out of my hand, this list. And he starts reading it and I'm freaking out because this guy's obviously pretty successful and he's looking at my goals that I haven't shared with anybody. And, you know, I'm afraid of being judged. I'm an 18 year old, punk, you know, kid and very insecure. And he says, Jim, when he's done, he's like, you are this close to everything on that list. And if you're not, you know, watching this on YouTube or somewhere, I'm, I'm t spreading my index fingers like a foot apart. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, no way, give me 10 lifetimes. I'm not going to crack that list. And then he puts his fingers to the side of my head, mm -hmm. meaning what was in between was the key. And he takes me into a room a little bit bigger than this. And it's wall to wall, ceiling, the floor covered in books. And remember, I've never read a book, you know, at all. Right. 
And so like, it's like being in a room full of snakes, right? That's how intimidated I am. But what makes it worse, he starts grabbing snakes and handing them to me. And I started looking at these titles of these books and there are these books of amazing men and women in history and very, some very early personal development books that you guys are familiar with. Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking, Thinking Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, mm -hmm. you know, Zig Ziglar, those kind of things. And he's like, Jim, he said, leaders are readers. I want you to read one book a week. And I'm like, what? Like, I was like, and, and I'm telling him like, I can't, I have all this schoolwork. And then he said that, that Mark Twain quote, don't let school get in the way of your education. <laughs> so great. And I was like, wow, that's so inspiring. And I can't, I can't do this. Like if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, but I can't. I don't have that ability. And he's very smart. He takes out my bucket list and he starts reading every single goal and dream of mine out loud. And I don't know, guys, like, it's like, imagine you're like very insecure, 18 years old. And like, you hear your dreams in another person's voice, like how in the, you know, it just messed with my mind and my spirit, something fierce. And a lot, honestly, a lot of things on that list were things I wanted to do for my, for my folks, things they would never do for themselves, even if they had the resources. So with that motivation, and I talk a lot about motive, human motivation and how to design and overcome procrastination personally, and also with other people around you, you know, in, in, in the book, but it, I say, okay, I'll do it. And I back, then fast forward, I'm back at school. I'm at, sitting at my desk. I have a pile of books I have to read and a pile of books I promised to read, right? That I want to read. And I already couldn't get through a pile A. So where do I get the time? I don't eat. I don't sleep. I don't work out. I don't go out with friends. I just live at the library and for a couple of months and not very sustainable. I end up passing out two o'clock in the morning in the library. I fall down a flight of stairs. I hit my head again. Oh. And I woke up in the hospital like two days later. And I was, I was down to 117 pounds. I had lost all this weight. You know, I was hooked up to all these IVs. I thought I died the, the scariest time of my life. And at that time, the nurse came in with a mug of tea and on it was a picture of Albert Einstein, you know, the guy I did the book report on, which is interesting because he had learning difficulties also. He didn't learn like everybody else. So I identified with him. But the quote on the mug was, the same level of thinking that has created your problem won't solve your problem. And made me say like, what's my problem? Well, I have a broken brain. I'm a very slow learner. Well, I was like, well, how do I think differently about it? Well, maybe I could fix my brain. Maybe I can learn how to learn. And then I, I dive into these books, you know, you know, then ancient mnemonics, you know, speed reading, all these different areas. 60 days into it, a light switch flipped on and I just started to just understand things for the first time sitting in class. Did my grades shot up and then my life got so much better. Did it really feel like that? Like a light switch? Like one moment yeah, you're like struggling yeah. through it, treading water, and then all of a sudden, boom. Like yeah, it, it's, it, it was because I felt like my brain was like kind of dormant the entire time. And then after a couple of months, just things just started to come to me with ease. You know, I don't know if the same thing happens with people's bodies after they, they work out a certain amount and they kind of get to work on some more second nature and they start kind of owning it, you know, and, and, you know, recognizing, you know, their strengths and what they could develop with their discipline. Um, and then I couldn't help but help other people. But how I did it, and this goes back to the public speaking, because I was very fearful of it. Um, I was broke, right? And I wanted to help people. So I was like, okay, I'm going to tutor, right? I'm, I, and this is bold for me, because I was always being tutored, but I was never like, how could I tutor, right? Because my friends, I was helping my sweet mates, and they were doing better. They were like, you could make money doing this and help people. And I was like, I don't know how, but I, when I was having that thought, there was a classroom that wasn't being used on a Thursday night. And I was like, okay, next week, I'm gonna put five or 10 people in that room, teach them free for a couple hours. And maybe afterwards, one or two of them wanna be tutoring, you know, right? and mm -hmm. I can help them. This is 18, 19 years old? 18 years old. 18, wow, yeah, okay. yeah, so I'm, I'm 50 now, so I'm 32 years ago. So I go and back to my dorm room, I take a magic marker, I put on a like simple piece of paper, free speed reading, memory, class, get better grades, less time, Thursday, seven o'clock, that room, right? And then next morning, I make some photocopies, put around campus, not a lot. Fast forward to next Thursday, seven o'clock, I'm just walking down the halls to the lecture center and I just, I hope just like five people show up. And I turn the corner and I swear to you, there's a whole crowd outside the classroom. And my honest reaction was like, oh shoot, I hope whatever's going on ends soon so I could do my thing, right? <laughs> this is it, because this, this is my mindset, right? And then I can't even get in because there's people in the doorway. I was like, what's going on inside? And there's this tall kid. He was like, there's a speed reading class. And I was like, wow, 
what a coincidence. What are the odds? Yeah. <laughs> what are the odds? The same room, the same night, the same time, there's another speed reading class, right? That's how slow I am. Because I realize in life, if you don't believe it, you just can't see it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I go in and every seat is taken, people standing in the back. And then I realize how, why they're all there because there's nobody teaching. <laughs> and then I freak the heck out because mm -hmm. I'm 18 years old. I look really young, t-shirt shorts. I have nothing prepared to talk about because I was just going to have a conversation with like four or five people. And, uh, and I'm phobic of public speaking. And I do a head count. Instead of five or 10 people, there's 110 people. 110, 110 people, people showed people. up first yeah. time. Yeah. Wow. And then, so I'm so terrified. I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna pass out from hyperventil. I leave because I would love to say it's different, but I, I just leave, right? And I go by these fountains because I can't even go back to my dorm room because I know my my sweet mates are going to make fun of me and everything. And I just kind of meditate, kind of calm my heart rate. And I hear this voice and it's my mom's voice in my head. And I won't tell you exactly what she said, but it's the essence is a hundred people came out. You promised to help them. You're disappointing them. You're disappointing me kind of message. And I'm doing this walking meditation back to my dorm room. And I take a step, I stop and I take a step back to the classroom and I go back and I, I realize that one step in another direction in our life can completely change our destination, right? You know, when we say yes to something, you know, like a little bit of courage to do something to take us, you know, into some, some new area. And I talked for a couple of hours and I apologize. And I honestly don't remember what I said as a memory expert. I have no idea. But afterwards, I come out of this kind of flow state. You know, I kind of felt like I was just channeling. I don't know if you guys are like, mm -hmm. just kind of comes through you. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I don't know how to help you, but I just need like 10 hours to teach you what I know. Um, and, you know, I, I just made this up. I was like, I get $30 an hour if you want to be tutored. I'll be in the student center tomorrow at noon. I can answer your questions. And I swear a hundred people get up and they all leave. Not one person talks to me that night. And I'm 10 o'clock at night or whatever in this classroom, I'm all alone. And I'm so exhausted. I end up falling asleep on the carpet. You know, because even when you do something you never thought you could face before, yeah. and I feel mentally, emotionally just spent. Drained, yeah. Yeah, and I end up waking up from the class coming in the next morning, eight o'clock in the morning. I'm like on the ground drooling on myself, and I run, I'm startled. I run back to my room, shower, go to breakfast, go to class, 12 o'clock comes up. I was like, oh, shoot, I was supposed to meet, you know, anyone at the student center. I run there hoping just one person, I'm validated by one person being there. And that same crowd of people are, are waiting for me. And at the end of two hours, 71 of the 100 kids wow. signed up for a course that didn't even exist. And I didn't even do the math beforehand. $30 an hour for 10 hours, 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't realize kids could go to an ATM machine and take, because I didn't have an ATM card or anything. <laughs> yeah. And so 300 times, seven, I have, so I'm not even 19 and I have $21,000 cash in my pockets in my book bag. And I'm, and I go back to my mentor thinking like, what am I going to do with this besides eat, you know, and, you know, not letting school get in the way of my education. I use all of it, nearly all of it to improve buy a my education. No, you didn't buy a whip. <laughs> <laughs> I travel around, I buy all these audio cassette tapes and everything and learn, you know, what I now teach. And, um, and I've been, and one of those 71 kids was this. Uh, freshman who read 30 books in 30 days. And did you, um, at that point, it, did you finish school or were you like, did you get the, did you like yeah. get the message? Like, yeah, well, I might well, there's some this. serious demand here. Yeah. yeah that seems yeah, like, yeah. like, to me, that's like a clear message. Like, this is what I need to yeah. do. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't quit, but I, um, I ended up going to school to school with other, you know, other people posting me to speak and I started doing this at universities. So we, we started, we did it at dozens and dozens. I would go to, hmm. UCLA and Harvard and bought BU and Fordham, NYU, just doing these courses. And then I self-published something back then, which was just like, you know, taking money orders and going to it, sending to a PO box. Was, there was no email or, you know, you know, websites to, you know, to send people to. And I, I created a, like a manual and I was very passionate. And what happened with these kids, get amazing results. So imagine having this, these tools back when you were in school and <clears throat> the parents took note and some of them were like, you know, found out about me and I started doing the, the company trainings you wow. know, for, for where they worked, wow. you know, and then eventually, you know, I, I, I met my co-founder Alexis, you know, 17, whatever years ago. And then we took everything online because we had a full-time learning center and, 
you know, was trying to figure out how we could reach more people, you know, and there was Did, little, Jim, I'm, I'm the, I'm the son of, of poor immigrants. So I know yeah. the, the, the feeling that you have where you really want to make them proud. You really want to, yeah. you know, you know what they sacrificed to, to bring you to a new place and speaking language. They worked really hard, did everything for you. How proud are your parents of you now? Yeah. I wrote the original book of Limitless really dedicated to them. You know, I realized that, you know, their sacrifice was, you know, all, you know, all our ancestors, their sacrifices are blessings. Right. You know, and, and that, that's a big motivator. I updated the book, the new book that just came out because um, I had a son this year, my first. Oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. So, um, you know, at 50, having a baby, you know, now, but I want, it's deep in our commitment, you know, our team and especially mine for the next generation. So they feel prepared. So the book really gives, you know, all the essentials from the first one and then so much more on momentum, like especially in a post pandemic AI rich world. Yeah. But that's, that's the big, that's a big impetus, like, you know, being a good, uh, being a good, a good, a good parent. What yeah. was, what was the first thing you did for them? I know at one point you reached a level of success that so you could do something for them. Did you do something for them? Yeah. Um, even when I wrote the original book, I, um, you know, years later I brought them to Greece. The largest chapter in the book is on memory enhancement. Mm -hmm. And I found out that, uh, there's a goddess of memory and Nemonides, and she's the, the mother of the nine muses of uh, science, literature, and art. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. And then I, you know, I found out that what did ancient Greeks do to memorize things 2,500 years ago before there were computers and printing presses. Mm -hmm. And I found all these amazing tools. And so I took them for a month to, to Greece. And that's where I wrote, you know, most of the book. That's I, was very, awesome. I was very inspired there. And, you know, they never really, they don't, no, haven't really traveled a whole lot. I find it interesting because we outsource so much of our, ability to find information, to remember things. Like yeah. I don't remember anybody's phone number anymore because it's all on my phone. Whereas yeah, when I was a yeah, kid, yeah. I knew everybody's phone number. Um, and the ways that they learned thousands of years ago, um, I think there's a lot of hints in terms of what works with our memory, yeah. what works with our ability to learn. For example, <clears throat> before we really did a good job of recording things, we sang stories yeah, yeah. because what role does music play and our ability to retain information and to just learn. Yeah, huge. I mean, perfect example. I mean, how many lyrics to songs do you guys know? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many did you go to class and really study yeah. all-nighters yeah. to learn? None. None, right? <clears throat> so music has a, an amazing ability to enhance learning. We had, um, we do an annual Brain Power conference, and we had Quincy Jones attending in the audience, oh, cool. you know, the nice. famous music producer. And I couldn't help but pull him on stage because, like, I mean, come on, there's yeah. what, what? What are the opportunities? Thriller, come on. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. And yeah. I, that was one of the questions I asked. I was like, everybody knows your achievements, Thriller, We Are the World, you know, so all the stuff. I want to know, like, about your problems. Like, what are the big problems you're facing now or in the past, and, and how did you overcome them? Great question. And he literally looked at me. He was like, I don't have any problems. This is Quincy Jones, and I'm like, and he's like 90 years old now, but you know, back, you know, this is like uh, 11 years ago. And uh, I was like, everybody has problems. I mean, what are you talking about? And he was like, no, I don't have problems. He's like, Jim, I have puzzles. And I was like, wow. He like reframes problems into puzzles. And I was like, wow, that's so elegant because often the problem is not the problem. Often the problem we're facing is our attitudes and assumptions about the problem mm -hmm. itself. And the, the fact that he calls them puzzles, that for some reason, it just makes it more fun. It makes it, like there's a solution, you know, to it. And that's how he's approached his whole life. But the reason I bring it up is he also speaks, no joke, 23 plus languages. Yeah, wow. people don't know this. What? And, uh, you know, and he always says, you have to go to know. Hmm. So he travels a whole lot, you know, with what he does. And he says he can learn, you know, things from their food, their art, and, you know, their language, their music. And, uh, and I think there's a correlate between going back to music, because obviously he's like, you know, one of the most iconic music producers in the world and language learning also as well. But even think about like, we talk about lyrics and how, how you know hundreds of songs after just hearing a couple of notes, um, like the ABCs, right? Yeah. You go A, B, like, can you say it without? without it's hard. It's yeah, without the music, right? Like <laughs> yeah. in your head. And I think it's like twinkle, twinkle, little stars. Like it's the, it's the, same, it's the same notes. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, ab absolutely. There's so many different ways. We actually, we, we talk about in the book using various music, like um, when you're studying, 
Now, some people, it's distracting. So like, again, going back to your brain animal, some people, you know, everybody learns a little bit differently. Um, but having music that doesn't have lyrics to it, especially classical music, mm -hmm. could help you get into a brainwave state called alpha. And alpha is a state where of a relaxed awareness where you just absorb information more easily, where your conscious mind is not critiquing you and it's kind of set aside. Specifically from the Baroque era, Vivaldi, Handal, um, because it's, it, it's 60 beats per minute, the notes, and that's it, it harmonizes with the resting heart rate, 60 mm. beats per minute. So research has shown that using listening to Baroque classical music in the background when you're studying, let's say you want to prepare a presentation, you know, you're going on stage or, uh, you know, you're learning some facts or a language. Jim, have you ever listened to what it sounds like? Because you're making me think of this. I wonder if there's a connection. Maybe mm -hmm. this is the theory. You ever hear what it sounds like in the womb? What babies hear in the womb? They hear the mother's heartbeat. Yeah. Do you think maybe that's what primed us to learn to th maybe music that kind of in, that induces that effect in us? I, I would imagine that that plays a, a, a significant role. I mean, I don't, I don't know any research that backs that up, but that would, anecdotally, I would imagine that that makes sense to me. Yeah, that's you know, very that, cool. Yeah, that I never thought of that either to, until right now. Well, speaking of the, okay, let's go back to the 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 four uh, types, animal types, that yeah. how we started this conversation. Uh, off the top of your head, like what are some strategies for each one of those animal types, let's say to learn, like how, yeah. since they're dolphins, I'm a cheetah, like, is there a different reading strategy for me yeah. compared to them? Yeah. So cheetahs tend to read in, um, in sprints because they're, they're really fast. So, so one of the things, and by the way, remember that I, I believe genius is, is built. It's not so much born. Right. And genius can be learned because genius leaves clues. So I also believe with the animals that, yes, we can switch our animals through dedication and training, right? So anybody can become more of an owl by leaning into, you know, uh, critical thinking and mm -hmm. rational, you know, any kind of training and books around, you know, around that. Um, so you're not limited to that, but most people stay in that. What's interesting is seeing people is like having your significant other take the quiz mm. because it also informs your communication style also as well, which you'll, which you'll see in the, in the report. Mm. But um, yeah, cheetahs tend to scan and, and skim. I, I recommend uh, using a visual pacer while you read. It'll help maintain your focus mm. through the information because your eyes are naturally attracted to motion. If somebody just like walks, which they are outside there, mm. I naturally look because it's, if you're a hunter gatherer and you're hunting, you're in a bush and you're hunting lunch in front of you, like say it's a rabbit or a carrot, you know, depending on your diet, right? It's probably a rabbit, but the, the bush next to you moves, you have to look because number one, you know, it could be lunch or number two, you could be, lunch. yeah, you could be lunch. <laughs> so your eyes are naturally attracted to motion. So when you're underlining the words or even the screen using a highlighter or your finger, not touching the screen or the book, you'll actually read better because your focus is on there. You know, even with creatives, you know, they remember stuff very well, like dolphins using uh, visualization, right? They, they, they think in a lot of times in pictures. Mm. So using uh, a memory palace, which we talk about, which is the ancient Greeks are attributed. So 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, um, the story goes Simonides was a poet and he gave a poetry reading in this building. And when he left and when he was done, something really tragic happened. The building collapsed and killed all the attendees. And because he's the lone survivor, he was responsible for helping family members identify their loved ones, right? And they didn't have like DNA testing and stuff like that. But he was able to, because he remembered where each and every one of them were sitting. And that's to go back to your brain. We remember things based on where things are because the context gives us the content. Even when you forget someone's name, you probably ask yourself, where do I know this person from, right? And think about it, as hunter-gatherers going back to, you know, evolutionary, like how things develop, we didn't need to remember a lot of numbers and, you know, definitions and stuff. What we needed to remember where was where things were. Where's the enemy tribe? Where's the fertile soil? Where's the clean water, That's right. right? That's everything. So the technique, you know- that, And so everything's in context of that. Yes, very much so. And so we remember things based in space, you know, even, you know, and even how we code the past, like if everyone's listening to this, like if it's safe and you could, you're not, you know, you're not lifting something, you're not driving, <laughs> um, just kind of close your eyes and just, you could, you could humor me with this. Um, I haven't done this on a podcast before, but if you can remember something in your past, like a past memory, 
as you're just kind of thinking, you get a sense of where that where that is around mm-hmm. 360 around you. Just point in that direction. Where where does that feel like that specific incident that happened a week ago, years ago? Maybe you could just kind of point a finger in that direction. Where where do you feel intuitively? Just it's different for every person, right? And then think about something in the future that you hasn't happened, but you know will happen. So then this is another way of coding a future memory where um, think about something that you know is going to happen a week from now. You're going to get on a plane. You're going to go to London. You're going to do something. And if you may have a presence of that image, point in that direction. It's like, where does that feel like that is? And so for most people, it's a different direction, mm-hmm. right? And so we learn to even store time based on like, we understand time based on where we have these memories. You know, there's something called timeline therapy where if you connect those two points, let's say your past was this way and your future was this way, that line becomes your timeline. Mm -hmm. Or some people, their past is behind them and literally something is going on in the future is in front of them and that's their timeline. Mm -hmm. And then what that allows them to do is in their timeline, kind of put their goals that they want to achieve or maybe even the back, like put things in the past that they want to kind of forget or kind of fix the past, like maybe even change some of their thoughts that, that, that are back there. Interesting. Not just what the thoughts are, but how they're thinking about it, like how they're seeing it, maybe making it smaller or bigger, those kind of things. But the idea here is we remember things in space. So, you know, the dolphins in the room, which definitely I'm outnumbered by, you know, they would remember things really well using this memory palace. You know, like uh, Sherlock Holmes talks about it in his writings. And if you ever watch like Elementary or some of the, some of the movies and <clears> television <throat> shows where he would take on an enormous amount of information and data and he would just store it in different places in his living room. So he would think about like his kitchen, like imagine your kitchen, right? Let's say if you're going clockwise in your kitchen and you have going clockwise, the microwave, the stovetop, the refrigerator, I'm making this up, the dishwasher and the sink, right? And you needed to remember five points to a speech or five things you need to do that day. Dolphins tend to think really well in pictures and images. A picture is worth a thousand words. So a lot of people are better with faces than they are with names because you see the face and you heard the name. And then so all you do is come up with an image of that thing you want to remember to do or say or whatever and put it in that first place. And oh, then, like in the order of the kitchen. Yeah. You, oh, okay. So let's say we were talking about how to have the best brain possible. And I talked about some of the best brain foods, right? I started talking about bone broth and I started talking about blueberries and avocados, whatever, eggs, which is like the most, one of the most amazing brain foods. I, and I put all that in my first place in the microwave, right? And that that's, if I'm going to give a TEDx talk and my first point is brain foods, I could see that I'm in the first place mm. in my home. Then I go over to the second place, which is my stovetop. And let's say the second key to a better brain is killing ants. I had this conversation on our podcast with Dr. Daniel Amen, you know, like the brain doctor. Mm-hmm. And he talks about killing ants, automatic negative thoughts. That's what ant stands for. You know, so I just imagine I'm killing ants on my stovetop. And that's my second point to my speech, right? The third thing that's really good for your brain is exercise, you know, and I look forward to having you on my show and talking about the power of fitness, right? Uh, BDNF, lowering systemic inflammation, right? Um, all, all these ama- blood flow, all these amazing benefits that come, you know, uh, helping with your, your uh, insulin uh, sensitivity, right? All the benefits that come to your brain from working out. So my third place is my refrigerator. And I imagine I open it up and I'm working out with the four of you guys, <laughs> right? In the refrigerator. And, it, and I don't have to rehearse it many times because that's so ludicrous. Yeah. Be able, if I could it. see it, yeah. And that's that's what's going on in the refrigerator, right? And if I want to talk about brain uh-huh. nutrients, which I talk about in the book, like all the nootropics and uh, supplementation, potentially if you're not getting it from your whole food diet, then I put all those supplements in the fourth place in my dishwasher. So I, my dishwasher is all clogged up because it has lion's mane in there and it has creatine in there and it has, you know, bacopa, you know what I mean? And then my, my fifth place in my, uh, in my kitchen going clockwise is my sink. And let's say the fifth place, the fifth key to a better brain, a limitless mind is a positive peer group. So I just imagine like all my positive friends doing dishes there, you know, cheerleading on. And then if I want to go into the next room, adjacent room, like the dining room, I'll do that for six, seven, eight, nine, ten, for my six to ten points of a of a talk. Wow. So it's, it's it's it takes more time to explain it, but we are a lot of times visual creatures, and 
you know, we tend to what we remember, what we see and what we feel, what we hear. The challenge is most of the time we're learning by what we hear and that's only using one of our senses. But if you could also see it in your mind and feel it emotionally, like killing ants on a stove, like kind of, you know, get a chuckle or like a little cringe, you're going to remember it because we remember things that make us feel, you know, a certain way. That's so brilliant because you're attaching it to something that you see every single day, 50 times. So everybody can memorize yeah. parts of their house where Absolutely. a piece of furniture and is, where the television is at, where's this. And yeah. so you could start to string together 15, 20 points that you have to cover yeah. in a, a speech or something. Unless you're living in like a, a studio apartment in New York City <laughs> and you have like one room, but then you could always go to your past homes that you or, yeah, in, work or, school, or your the, favorite place to go, the mall, you know, whatever, any place. Cause, and then just using this and that's what a, a, a mind palace is, you know, for, for people who want to pump up their mind. Yeah, that's awesome. I, 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 I've done that with, um, I'll, ha I have a really good long-term memory, maybe not short-term, but long-term. And, um, it, when I remember a, a study or something to bring up on the show, I always picture it. Yeah, I'll, I'll literally picture the the study, the web page, yeah. or the place that I read it, um, and it makes it very easy for me to recite and talk about. Yeah, and and also because you're in your element, you know, as as a dolphin, you know, a lot of dolphins think in pictures. You know, if I was asking you to describe your car to me, right, right. Like, tell me about your car. Yeah, well, it's blue, it's SUV. Right. Yeah. And, and you probably don't see the words blue SUV. No. You yeah. see a, an image of right. it, right? Even when you, you're on airplanes, right? You don't, no longer does it say no smoking or, you know, fasten your seat belts. There's just an image, yeah. right? Well, you know, original writing was, were really pictures representing yeah. objects. Um, it, I, don't, I don't think people um, appreciate just how abstract modern writing is to create letters that represent sounds, put the yeah. sounds together to make words and so on a very abstract like you know breakthrough of being able to record things but um really it's representing pictures very very much so if you think about hieroglyphics or you know, a lot of the even uh ancient languages are like yeah that. even even a lot of the asian languages the characters represent mm -hmm. this is what a house looks like and you said genius is not innate but rather cultivated. explain that yeah because I, I, I think genius i think well there's like you know like uh, there's athletes yeah. that are at the top of the level one percent of one percent genetics play a big role right C certainly yeah I, I feel like uh for the most part uh genius can be uh it can be built and it's not always born i mean certainly when it comes to our brain research suggests about one third of it is predetermined by genetics and biology but that leaves a majority of it but two-thirds is in your in your control wow. or at least influence you know, the five things that I mentioned, you know, move the needle, but so does a clean environment. You know, that's, that would be number six for me, you know, it meaning a clean environment, you know, when you organize your computer or you, you just have clarity of thought, mm -hmm. you know, so your external world is a reflection of your internal world. You know, another thing that would fall underneath those two thirds, um, if that's number six, I'm just going through my home right now. Um, number seven would be, would be sleep. Right, yeah. you know, just like I mean, how's your brain functioning on a poor night's sleep? Oh God, how's your ability to focus? You have a energy? you have a you have a baby. Well, how old is your kid now? Nine months. Okay, so yeah, you yeah. you just got through the toughest part, but yeah, like, what's it like? We're, uh, we're, we're still going through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much does that affect your your thinking? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So, any tips you guys have on, on that? <laughs> just uh, that, hang that's on. Totally night nanny, yeah. night nanny, good investment. Get yeah. Very good investment. It's just, yeah. Yeah. It gets better. That's but, and that's the thing. Like, and then I talk about human motivation. A big part of human motivation, besides having purpose, is having energy. If somebody ate a big processed meal and they want to motivate themselves to to study or to read, sure. right, then they're probably not going to be very motivated. If someone hasn't slept in four nights for me with the, with the baby, but I'm not, it lowers your, your motivation, creates friction for you working out, mm -hmm. right? So the energy is a big deal. But sleep, you know, I don't know your favorite sleep tips, but you know, for me, getting sunlight first thing in the morning is so very important. You know, I go outside, I, I need 15 minutes outside as soon as I wake up. I try to get the elements. I, I don't talk about this a whole lot, but you know, while there's fancy biohacking and I you know, have the sauna and the cold plunge and the flow tanks and everything, um, you know, for me, I, when I was talking about ancient Greece, I, I, when I was doing a lot of study there, a lot of ancient cultures believe that everything was made up of four elements, mm -hmm. Babylonian times, Greek times, air, water, fire, earth, right? So I just, it's just nurturing for me to have the mindset is like, okay, when I wake up, I want to get those four elements in my life. So I'll go outside, I'll get grounded on the earth. Some people say there's an electron exchange, helps you feel grounded, um, reduce stress and so on. Uh, for me, it just feels anecdotally, just feels like I'm, I feel solid. Um, no, number two, I'm getting the the fire from this from the sun, mm -hmm. right? You know, your eyes are the only part of your brain that's outside of your skull. It helps to reset your circadian rhythm, helps you sleep better at night. The third thing I'll do is hydrate 
because we can lose up to a pound of water when we sleep mm -hmm. through respiration and perspiration. Even a 2% dip, like a dehydration, could, have, could dramatically affect your cognitive totally. performance. So, you know, we're all, you know, you drink that water, um, your brain is mostly water. I, I, I read, I had somebody on our podcast, Dr. Lisa Moscone, she's a neuroscientist and a nutritionist. And she said that upwards of, you know, staying hydrated will boost your reaction time and things beat upwards of 30%. Wow. You know, which is amazing. So that's water. So I have earth, I have fire, I have water, and then air. I just do some breathing to get rid of the, the kind of mental cobwebs. You know, if I feel, cause I have to take, you know, a little bit of stuff to help me sleep at night and just kind of a little groggy. You, so I find the breathing helps. You know what I like about what you're doing is that you, you're marrying wisdom with uh, um, current science and technology. Yeah. Because I think that uh, there's there's a lot in both. I think there's a lot of value in both. And I think sometimes, you brought one of them up, one of them up grounding, the, the trade of electrons. I think we know that studies show that walking barefoot on like grass or dirt seems to have this positive effect. But then I think what happens is we try to explain it mm -hmm. with, you know, these really, okay, well, it's a trade of electrons. You know what it, it probably is? It's probably like, there's a lot of nerves on the bottom of your foot. They're covered by shoes. All the, it's like having gloves on all the time. Yeah. So then you take your socks off and you walk on a, on a grass it's or yeah. dirt, which I mean, that's, you think it's just your foot that's getting stimulated? It's your brain that's getting stimulated. So, I, so I feel like it's a lot more simple than we try to go so far. Like, yeah. oh well, there's electron charge. And there's, yeah, it, there's right. all this weird stuff. Like, no, I think honestly, your feet just we cover them all the time. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I mean, there's this whole kind of grounding culture, or just our barefoot culture. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, I I love it. It just even anecdotally, it just makes me feel good, and yeah. that's kind of where I go. And 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 this stuff also. I mean, I'm talking about like 12 minutes in the morning. It's not right. like a three hour biohacking you know routine, and it costs nothing. No, for anybody who's listening to this right now. You mentioned nootropics. Our, our audience is going to want. Of mm -hmm. course, they're going to get mad if we don't ask you about those. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's talk. Let's talk about the the nootropics that you know that seem to actually have an effect and how yeah. much of an effect do they have in comparison to lifestyle changes? Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, get it for my diet kind, kind of person. And, and, and again, there, there's a quote in Limitless from a French philosopher and he says, life is the letter C between B and D where B stands for birth, D stands for death, life C choice. Right. And, you know, it always, our, our lives are the sum total of all the choices we've made up to this point. Right. Mm -hmm. Who are we going to marry? Who are we going to spend time with? Where are we going to live? What are we going to do? What are we going to eat? What are we going to feed our mind? All that stuff. Um, you know, and so I believe these difficult times, they could diminish us. These difficult times can develop us or, or you know, or or diminish us, right? And it's just how we decide, um, including the choices we make, what we put in our body. So, you know, but the problem is a lot of stuff we can't get through food. Like, but you could supplement, somebody could supplement with choline, which is really good for cognitive health, but I, I'd rather people get it from their eggs or, mm -hmm. or somewhere else, another source. I mean, my, my go-tos for this, I want to make sure the foundation's there, you know, that I have my omega-3s, my DHAs, my vitamin D levels or are check. And everyone could also go to a functional medicine doctor and, you know, have these, get, do a no, nutrient profile and see what you might be lacking. Um, you know, but all the ascent, all the essentials, um, the choline in eggs, the precursor for acetylcholine, which, um, which is very important. So if not, people can't eat eggs, then they could supplement with it also as well. Some of my go-tos, I mentioned creatine, you know, um, you know, obviously it's, it's very, very popular for people who do, um, do who are exercising on a regular in incredible cognitive effects. Oh yeah. Do you guys notice that also? Like, oh no, we like talk about it all the time. Talk we talk about, about it all the time. It's, it's the ultimate longevity supplement effect. Yeah. Yes. Finding, so. so yeah, so the, some of the things that we highlight there are some basic nutrients and then some of the, the nootropics would be some things like uh, a Bacopa, mm -hmm. right? Um, ashwagandha. Uh, some things also that, that come through my, my go, some of my go-tos, like, especially if you want to get in for performance, alpha GPC. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we, we put a whole bunch, um, in the book. Also, we're going to put that actually put by the time this airs, we'll put all the recommendations on, on our website okay. for free brainnutrition.com. What are the, that. what are the things that you expanded on? Cause your first book was a hit. Yeah. Uh, this is expanded edition. So what did you add? What did you change? Or yeah. So different? it's really all about momentum. So like once you, the, the three sections of the book, when I was first writing the book, it was all methodology. 100% methodology, how to read three times faster, how to learn languages, how to remember speeches, build your business vocabulary, whatever. And before I hit send to my publisher, I asked myself this question. I don't know where it came from, but I was like, will 
everyone who reads this book get what they're hoping for? And my honest answer was no, because a lot of people know methods, right? I don't know how you guys, with your listeners, with your clients, it seems like a lot of people know what to do. You know, especially your listeners, they've probably forgotten more about, you know, personal transformation and fitness than most their friends and family, right? But are they doing what they learn right. all the time? Why aren't they doing it? Yeah. And I really think for every hour you spend listening to a podcast or reading a book, we should dedicate an equal hour to putting it into play. Otherwise, you know, somebody reading a book, someone who has decades of experience, you put into a book and somebody could sit down and read that book in a few days, they could download decades in a days. That That's the biggest advantage besides the benefits of reading, right? Reading is to your mind what exercise is to your body. I mean, if you're looking for, you know, brain training, reading is, especially the way we teach it, is very active and, 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 uh, and, and so very important. But go, going back to the well, you know what we're what we're talking about here in in the in the context of of reading in the context of what's new. There's three areas. There are two areas that have to come before methodology, and there's three M's: mindset first, right? So the mindset is your set of assumptions and attitudes about something. So if somebody learns a great method for making money, but their mindset is money is the root for, of all evil, Forget or it. I have to hurt people to make money, right. they're still going to be stuck in that box. So mindset has to be addressed. People, I just did this pr- talk at Google uh, two days ago, you know, and somebody before I went on stage like, I'm so glad you're here. You're a memory expert. I'm, I'm really stupid. Like, I, I don't even know. Like he, this person had a lot of imposter syndrome for being there. And I was like, wait, wait, stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. You know, like if you fight for your limits, they're yours. I don't know if you have clients or you hear people talking about what they can't do, mm-hmm. right? And they're trying to sell you on it. Um, because I believe your brain is this incredible supercomputer and your self-talk is a program that will run. So if you tell yourself, I'm not good at remembering people's names. You won't remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer mm-hmm. not to. So mindset has to be addressed. So that's the first section. The second section is motivation. We've talked about that throughout this conversation. It's like, what was that young ladies who read 30 books in 30 days? What was her motivation, mm. right? Because then you don't have to use willpower or pump yourself up because you're tapping into a deep purpose. For me, motivation is three things. If you want to motivate yourself, if you want to have motivate somebody else, the formula is P times E times S3. You need purpose, you need energy, and you need small, simple steps. Like somebody could have, if you don't have purpose, you feel. Because a lot of people, they, they, they have a purpose here in their head, but not in their heart, and they're not going to follow through because it's just intellectual. Because we are, you know, we are not logical, we're, we are biological. You think about dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, we are this chemical feeling soup, mm-hmm. right? So you have to feel it. But someone can have purpose to work out and still not do it because they lack the energy because they're not sleeping or whatever. That's why we talk about so many tips on how to optimize your energy. Because I don't believe you have energy, you generate energy. You don't have focus, you do focus. You don't even have a memory. There's a process, three-stage process for remembering something. So sometimes we trick ourselves into submission by what we say. You know, and if when you take the nouns in your life and you turn them into verbs, you have power. So you don't have energy or you don't have creativity, you do it. There's a process for mm. creating. There's a process for energizing yourself. It's also empowering. Incredibly, because it gives you back your agency, right? Like, so you're not waiting, you're not waking, waking up and hoping, oh, I hope I have creativity to make videos today and, and write my book or <laughs> I gotta to make podcast. creativity. Crazy. Exactly, and you turn it into a verb and then you have your power. So this book is full of, the methodologies, the processes, right? So you don't you don't have focus, you do it. You don't have a memory, you do it. And so that that's the purpose. But I realized that post pandemic AI world, and then with the impetus with, you know, turning 50 and having my firstborn, you know, I realized the importance of the fourth M, which is momentum. And so the book is really the core of the book, this new version, the updated version, not only does it have lots of new science and case studies from our previous readers, so you could kind of follow their track going through their hero's journey, like Star Wars, but also there's new chapters. So there's chapters on nootropics, which everything is human studies. And every if you, if you like to nerd out over that stuff, it's highly referenced. Um, the, the chapter we talked about on My Brain Animal, right? Like, you know, your cognitive types. And I walk you through examples of how teams play out and how they communicate um, and how they learn differently, you know, and how to create a learning organization. Um, so that that's very powerful. The, the, another chapter is brand new is learning agility. Like how do you, with people working hybrid in offices, remotely, how do you make, like you teach people how to, you know, you have an amazing gym outside, you know, to be more physically agile, right? They're fast, mm. they're flexible, they're pliable. Um, 
but I, want, I also want people to be mentally agile, right? I want, I want their thoughts to be faster, right? Their, 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 their problem solving to be quicker, more agile, their thinking to be more pliable. And so we, we talk a lot about that in the workplace specifically. Um, and then, you know, chapters on AI, uh, on how to use AI to enhance your HI. That's my driving question when it comes to AI. I don't see it as artificial intelligence. I see it more as augmented intelligence. It's there to augment you. It's there to serve and support you. So how do you use AI to improve your HI, your human intelligence? So in there are, are a series of prompts, how we work with coaching clients on how to learn anything faster utilizing AI. Like, so for example, we have a podcast, uh, Sometimes I don't get the book in time mailed to me and I, I, I don't like reading stuff on screens because I'm looking for, I don't need another reason to be on a screen. Uh, <laughs> and because also visual fatigue leads to mental fatigue, mm. right? And sometimes screen time could do that. But also, you know, so now I'll go on, and, you know, on, on, a, on to an AI chat program and say, hey, summarize this book for this, right? Or give me some thoughtful questions, you know, that this author hasn't been asked before that would, that our audience would appreciate, right? Wow. You know, something like that. And I, I don't always use it verbatim. I rarely do, but it, it gives me a, some kind of spark or foundation. You know, I'll go through it and, you know, AI could help you with, a, be an incredible learning buddy. It could not only summarize books, right? But it, you, you say like, hey, Jim mentioned this thing, neuroplasticity. You go in there and say, explain to me neuroplasticity as if I'm eight years old. And you'll get this nice little summary comparing it to a tree or something else like that, that you just get this aha, right? Um, I'll go through it and it could rate your reading speed, your reading comprehension. You know, every principle that we talk about in Limitless, we show you how to use it using AI. So if I talk about retrieval practice, right? You, you, when you learn something brand new, you encode it, you store it, you retrieve it, but also testing yourself and asking questions to see if you know it. So it could ask very thoughtful questions to see how much information you really retained, you know, on a subject and it goes on and on. So we have like dozens of different strategies to use AI to enhance your, you know, your human intelligence and all these nootropics, understanding your brain type, you know, AI, all of it could help you have greater momentum, greater velocity, you know, with less effort and more, certainly a whole lot more enjoyment. Just to back you up on the energy thing. Um, you, you know, when you say you have energy, logically you would think, like a machine, right? You have a car, you put gas in it. Yeah. Anytime I turn it on, anytime I drive it, I'm going to waste gas. I'm going to waste energy. Yeah. Human body doesn't work that way. If you sit still, uh, you don't necessarily conserve energy. If anything, you start to produce less of it. So this yeah. is why moving and exercise makes you more energetic. You're not wasting the energy that you have. You're creating energy. Oh, so just yeah. to kind of back you up to, you know, kind of what you're saying. Yeah. No, I want to I I I geek out over that on my podcast. <laughs> so, this is what everyone wants, right? Yeah. You know, and so, you know, exercise is one of the most important things that people could do for their brain performance. Totally. You know, with them Are, it, on that note, I, I'm sh I know of, obviously you've probably spoken to a lot of high performing executives and business people, people in academics. I wonder if uh, high level athletes have reached out to you to talk. Cause I mean, there's, so, I mean, we know this now, yeah. but the, your ability to think is such an important aspect of, yeah. of high level athletic performance. Have you worked with athletes? Have they come to, to you to say, hey, I need to get better at this, whatever. Can your, can your techniques help me? Yeah. Um, the, bu the book is endorsed by a number of athletes, uh, gold medalists, you know, from um, Apollo Ono to, to, to Novak Djokovic to, to others. You know, I'm just very blessed. You know, I, I help athletes with everything from post-concussions, you know, for in terms of mm. not only bouncing back, but bouncing forward. Uh, you could help them to be able to remember playbooks you know, at rapid fires, um, also reaction time, thinking speed, focus, memory, all of, all of this, it doesn't matter where your, your stadium or your arena is, right? It could be, it could be in a classroom or it could be in, a, in an office or it could be on a field somewhere on a court somewhere. Carries I mean, over to everything. Yeah. Your, your brain, I just want to remind people who are listening, you know, I, I, I just, I, I love the, the name of your podcast. I just, I just, I wish I thought of it, <laughs> my, my <laughs> mind pump, honestly. But if you want to pump up your mind, you know, you, it's a reminder that you are the pilot of your, your brain. You're not the passenger, right? And so many people act as sometimes that they're on the receiving end and they're, they're a victim or it's happening to them. You know, I just want to remind people, I told, I mentioned this on a previous podcast that, that I was on your show with, you know, I got to spend some time with Stan Lee mm -hmm. and we're going to dinner Stan Lee, who created you know, all the, the Marvel Universe, co-created it. And I was like, I need to know this. I'm so nervous to ask him, but I end up like, 
hey, Stan, I've always wanted to know, you created all my favorite characters, which one's your favorite? And he goes, Iron Man. And mm. he's like, Jim, who's your favorite character? And he had this uh, Stanley tie, this uh, like Spider-Man tie, right? And he said, and I say, Spider-Man. And without a pause in his iconic voice, he goes, with great power comes great yeah, responsibility. responsibility. And we yeah. all know that. Everyone <laughs> listening knows that. Yeah. And it, it's amazing because I sometimes reverse things when I hear it. Uh, maybe because I had a few head injuries when I was a kid and Sometimes when I read, I reverse things and I heard something different. I was like, Stan, you're right. With great power comes great responsibility. And the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. You know, when we take responsibility for something, we have great power to, to make it better, right? And I feel like sometimes, you know, in this culture, there's a lot of people making excuses. There are a lot of people that complain. And, and my thing is as a coach, Complain, it literally complaining wastes time, it wastes energy, and nothing changes, right? We can't be upset by the results we didn't get from the work we didn't do. Right. It's, just, it's, just, it's just a truth, right? And so what I would rather people do is to take ownership, you know, and we hear like, you know, Jocko, you know, discipline equals freedom and be mm -hmm. able to get yourself to do these things. But, you know, and we hear people say all the time that you have to choose your heart, right? Not knowing is hard and knowing is hard. Like we choose our hard. Being right. broke is hard. Making money can be hard. You know, we choose it. Being sick is very hard. You know, working out, eating right, sleep is hard, but we have to make that. But I really think life is difficult for two reasons, either because we're leaving our comfort zone or because we're staying in our comfort zone. Yeah. You know, that's why I love your community. You know, I was engaged in like in all your social media and listen to your shows because, you know, listen to what people call in and talk about because they're, they're leaving their comfort zone, right? They're not settling. They don't want to just have mediocrity and it's a choice that we always have. So awesome. Jim, it's been nine months. How has fatherhood changed you? Besides the lack of sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this is, it's been the biggest it's been the biggest blessing. You know, this is something, um, I'll, I'll say this, like it was interesting going through it because a, as a man, you know, you, I don't have to do nearly as much work or effort or anything, uh, you know, uh, you know, well, I wasn't pregnant. I was there to be able to support my wife and, but you know, even post, you know, she's absolutely amazing. But I, I, I will say I went in with the attitude. I was like, oh, I'm a totally like educate this kid. I'm going to biohack the heck out of him. <laughs> get him training, do all this stuff and reading it. And while I still plan to do a lot of that, um, it's been the opposite. Instead of teaching, I've been learning so much. Mm. You know, the th I'll tell you the, the biggest growth I've had in my life with all the influence that books have had and people I've had the opportunity to meet, it's come from three things. You know, number one, intimate relationships. Right, and we could go down a whole rabbit hole about how they're a mirror and how vulnerable you are and mm -hmm. how everything comes up and it's a reflection. So that, that's that been a big growth for me. Um, number two, entrepreneurship. I don't know how you guys feel, but I feel like you guys own your business and you know it's different than just relying on you know a, a paycheck. Of you course. Know? And so everything falls on your shoulder. You know, our team, their payroll, everything's just your responsibility. And I just feel like I've grown a lot as an entrepreneur through entrepreneurship. And the, th and the third area is now just, you know, being, being a father, yeah. you know, in terms of growth. You, uh, you wait, I, I waited long. I waited till I was 40. Um, you wait till 50. Yeah. Why? Um, it's, it's been a, you know, my, my career is, is pretty intense, you know, and I want my, my parents worked a whole lot as immigrant parents do many jobs. And, um, you know, I really want to be, be there and be, be more readily available. Also, you know, with the focus with our team is really on the mission. You know, we feel like that the world is in a little bit, is, is very, there's a lot of crazy going on in the world and we feel like we could add value. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like Limitless, you know, this book, the original book overtook Obama's book for six straight days to be the number one book of all nonfiction. Awesome. Uh, globally on Amazon. But I feel like it was, be, began, it was in, you know, this was in the beginning of the pandemic and people felt the opposite. They felt limited, right? So I think Limitless was something that was inspiring for them. And I believe we also live in the millennium of the mind and, you know, but nobody shows us how to do that. So then we wrote the book to be an owner's manual for your mind, you know, because once you understand how your brain works, you could work your brain, you know, in, incredibly, you know? And so, you know, a lot of it was my, my own, you know, career and everything. But, um, but I'm, 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 things are happening 
at the right time. Uh, with, you, with immigrant parents, let me guess, like you, you success, making money, mom and dad are like so proud of you, but they probably were like, when are you going to have a baby? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For her, for my wife's siblings and my siblings, they all have their kids. Right? Yeah. So we were, we were the last ones. Uh, like, oh, Jim does were a good you, job. Were no you misunder- <laughs> I felt like I was misunderstood about that. Were you misunderstood about that? Like yeah. People thought I was uh, scared of commitment and all these things. It had nothing to do with that. No, no, it had nothing. No, not, not for me. I've, I've always known wanted, wanted, wanted to, 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 to grow the family. Yeah. It's me always, too. Always that's why I mean, I was misunderstood by it. that's what people, other people thought were you misunderstood? Like people. Yeah. <sighs> I'm, I'm sure, you know, um, and that, 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 that doesn't have so much of an effect, uh, you know, for me, just cause I'm, I'm very, my, 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 my values are, you know, people ask, this is a great question to ask, you know, everybody is, and I would love for people to post it and maybe tag us all in it so we get to see it. What's most important to you in, in life? Because once you understand your values, you, going back to motivation, purpose, energy, small, simple stuff, purpose, once you understand what motivates you in your life, like for me, it's love, growth, contribution, adventure, which I added just recently, because I just want to enjoy this process too, mm-hmm. you know, but I, I would do anything for the people that I care about. And, you know, and so I feel like, you know, and all the other noise and expectations and opinions. The other thing is I have references. Like my dad lost his, both his parents when he was 13. So that's why he came to this country because he was in poverty and they couldn't afford, you know, to feed him and everything. So I grew up with this mantra that family is most important. So it was like, you know, and then my mom lost her mom when she was a teenager and it was just this whole thing. So, you know, it, it formed who we are. And I honestly, I respect, you know, so, so many people that are strong because I've never met one strong person that had an easy life, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, this is, I just, I just want to remind people if they're struggling right now, you know, there's some things we can only learn in a storm, right. Mm. You know, and some storms come because they clear our way. And I just want to say to whoever's going through that right now, that you inspire people around you, whether they acknowledge it or not with your, with your grit, you know, and your grace. But I spent a lot of time at senior centers because I lost my grandparents. Never really got to know them. And my grandma died of Alzheimer's. And so I'm just very conscious and we donate the proceeds in my author proceeds to build schools for children, uh, in Ghana, Guatemala, Kenya for Alzheimer's research, you know, in memory of my grandmother. But, um, spending time in senior centers, I help polish off their memories, but I also hear a lot of great story and a lot of wisdom that because previous generations, like they had, I mean, we just don't have it tough. No matter (laughs) what's going on, we just don't have what they had. And so I like, I learn a lot selfishly, but also I hear a lot of regret, you know, somehow this person, you know, they didn't pursue this relationship because what other people would think about that, or they pursued a career because it was expected of their parents or whatever. And, you know, I just want to remind people that when we're taking our final breaths, it's not like a fun conversation, you know, but when we're at the end, none of other people's opinions and expectations are going to matter. None of our fears are going to matter. What's going to matter is the things that matter to us. You know, I always say the most important thing is to keep the most important things, the most important things, (laughs) right? And so those are your values, the things that you hold. And it's different for every person. Some people value freedom, some people, whatever, you know, safety or whatever it happens to be, you know, but I would just say, sometimes we feel burnt out, not because we're doing too much. Sometimes we feel burnt out because we're doing too little of the things that make us come alive, right? The things that light us up. You know, and so I just, maybe it's just kind of a, you know, for me, it was a wake up call. Like I, I, I got into a car accident. Like I, I, this, this Limitless in 2020 was my first book out of a 32, you know, 30 year career. People think I have like a dozen books, but I waited to do my, 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 kind of my, my my opus here for my work. But it was part of, I didn't want to be famous. Like I, like I don't don't think I'm famous now, but, but it's tough when you want to help people and not be known for it. And I was in this car accident and I should have died. And it gave me perspective, right, about legacy. And so, you know, that week I signed the book deal that was, I've had for years, you know, offered, awesome. you know, because it just makes me think. So yeah, this is a, this is a big year, 50 newborn, new book, you know, but I just, I'm, yeah, I, I just want, I want to, I want to be useful while I'm here. Yeah, yeah well, you're doing a great job. Your yeah, your, your you. interviews do really well with our audience. They take a lot oh, from them. You. And your book is uh, they 
we get messages from people saying they got a lot from your book. So thank you. I, I, I am, let all, our whole audience read read his book. It's Thank exceptional. You. We'll definitely improve your life. Yeah, yeah. we'll take the animal Keep, quiz too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> MyBrainAnimal.com is a great place to start. And then post your animal. You get this nice AI art that we made and then tag us all in it so we get to see it. I'll repost a, a few and then gift a, a bunch of signed copies out to your audience. Awesome. And the, and the book's at LimitlessBook.com. Thank if you, you. And if you like podcasts, you know, ours is, is 15 minutes long. Way, 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 way different. Once I think you're doing sour after this, right? You guys, yeah, are you yeah, guys yeah. Doing, oh, awesome. for 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> you ever heard me talk? Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <to show him laughs> that. Just throw him a quarter and he'll yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah, right. Now, Jim, God bless. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys Appreciate so much. Thank you. Thank you.